Thank you. Uh, this is my first time to ICTP, and it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me, for the rest of you for staying here. And I'm particularly pleased, actually, to uh, be introduced by uh, uh, Professor Kulkani <laughs> Ravi. Uh, it turns out that there's some, I had some connections with uh, ICTP from uh, the beginning of my career. Uh, when I first went back to Singapore in 1988, uh, it was still classified as a developing country by the UN, I think. And uh, I'm really quite impressed by what ICTP does with uh, trying to promote uh, well, mathematics and physics in a de developing country. So I spent a few years in Singapore uh, sort of bumping around and not really doing mathematics. And uh, some of my colleagues tried to help me and say, we should do something. And they were group theories. And for some reason, uh, by some luck, we found a book of conference proceedings from ICTP on a group theory from a geometric point of view. Uh, this was in 1990, published in 1990. And, and there was a wonderful article by uh, Professor Kokani. And uh, we just zoomed in on it, and uh, it somehow we wrote a few papers uh, based on his paper, and it sort of really revived my career. So I, I think this is kind of a, it's really nice to come back here and sort of know that, you know. Right, so, so it's really nice to come back here and see people who had played such a key role at the beginning of my career, uh, well, 25 years old. So anyway, uh, today I'm going to give a, I'm giving the last talk, so I try not to make it too tiring for you all. Uh, I'm going to be talking about identities on hyperbolic surfaces. And uh, I will try and give you the basic ideas behind the proofs of these identities uh, without going too much into the technical de details. Okay, here's my plan. Okay, so minus one was to thank the organizers. <laughs> then I give an introduction. Uh, I'm, I wrote that down because uh, I'm no longer a young uh, postdoc. I'm 55 years old and... Uh, if I don't write it down, I'll forget. So uh, as the last speaker, I think uh, I would like to, on behalf of all the participants, uh, the other lecturers and all, uh, thank the organizers for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, so in particular, uh, yeah, let's. <laughs> so I should mention their names. Uh, I probably get it all wrong. Uh, so uh, Jose Siade or Pepe. Uh, John Parker, uh, Todd Drum, and then uh, Bertrand Deron, who's uh, left us for the time being. <laughs> Not permanently. <laughs> Not permanently. <laughs> okay, so that takes care of uh, point minus one. So I'm going to give a quick introduction. I'm going to introduce uh, four sets of identities and then give you a quick uh, idea about how really, if you look at it the right way, the proofs are quite uh, simple. Okay, And then... Uh, well, the last set is uh, something I did with Feng Luo, uh, which just appeared uh, last year, I guess. Okay, so this, since this is a conference on a geometry of discrete action, I really wanted to tie it in my talk in with the title of the conference. So uh, the discrete groups come from the topology of the surfaces. Yeah, you look at the fundamental group of a surface, it's a discrete group. Uh, you can also look at some other discrete groups, like the automorphism group of... Uh, of the fundamental group, or since it's a surface, you can look at a mapping class group. Now, the t my talk is about identities on surfaces, and somehow they're related to these two sets of discrete group action. The first set of discrete group action is when you think of this, the fundamental group of a surface as a subgroup of uh, PSL2R, and then you get, uh, you get a hyperbolic surface, yeah. Actually, the identities turn out to be related to these other group action, which is the mapping, uh, the mapping class group action on the Teichmuller space, which is the space of all uh, hyperbolic structures. And uh, there's a very symmetric on this, uh, on this uh, Teichmuller space, and that's uh, preserved under this uh, action, and then you get a modelized space. And it turns out that some of the identities have uh, very, very important applications uh, in that case as well. Okay. But I won't go, go too much into the second uh, interpretation. Okay. So, uh, my main aim is really to give you a, I mean, to talk about the last identity, which is an identity I did with uh, Feng Luo, 
and which uh, appeared, I said, last year. And, but in the process, I really want to encourage all of you. I didn't participate in a problem session, but I want to encourage all of you to sort of go out and find your own identities, basically. Uh, I think you, if you have the right point of view, uh, then sometimes you know, a nice idea comes to you in the middle of the night or something, and you can sort of push it ahead and then sort of really get some interesting mathematics. Okay. So uh, there are four sets of identities, like I say, uh, Basmajan, Ma uh, Maxine, Bridgman, and then the ones uh, I did with Fingluo. I'll discuss uh, the actual identities themselves first, and then I'll give you some generalizations and applications, and I'll end up with uh, the sketch of the proofs. Okay, we we'll start with uh, Basmajan. So the idea here is I have a hyperbolic surface with a boundary. Okay, something like this. Now on this surface, I can look at a set of geometric objects which are called the auto uh, auto geodesics, and let's orient the auto geodesics. So what's an uh, auto geodesic? It's a geodesic arc which starts from the boundary and ends at the boundary and is perpendicular to the boundary at both the starting and ending points. So it could look something like this. It could go around a little bit, go around a little bit over here, and then it comes over here. Right? So this is an example of an auto geodesic. Now the set is a countable set, an infinitely, infinite countable, countable set. And for each auto geodesic, you can associate, since I started with hyperbolic structure, I can associate a length to this uh, auto geodesic. We call this set of lengths the auto spectrum. Okay? So uh, Basmajan in 93 proved uh, this uh, quite uh, beautiful identity. It says that uh, if I sum over the set of all auto geodesics, so alpha ranges over the set of all auto geodesics, and then there's this function, b, of the length of alpha, okay? And the function is very simple. It's just a two log cotangent of x over two. So let me write it down, bus margin. Use white. Sum over the set of all auto geodesics of this function of the length of the auto geodesic is equal to L, where L is the length of the boundary, okay? So in, this, in the example I drew, there were four boundary components. Each one has length L1, L2, L3, L4. So the sum is equal to the sum of L, uh, L1, L1 up to L4, yeah. And I, I guess I won't write out the, the function. It's a very simple function, and uh, in the course of the proof, you see how the function appears. The second identity I want to talk about is uh, the Bridgman identity. Uh, let me write the Bridgman. So the setting is exactly the same. You start with a hyperbolic surface with geodesic boundary, and then you look at the set of all auto geodesics. But what Bridgman did was he found another function, which I write as BR of alpha. And I sum up over all the auto geodesics. And this is equal to the volume of the unit tangent bundle, okay? Which I can write, I say, 2 pi times the area of S. Let's see. Okay, so let me move to the next page. So this is Bridgman's identity. You're summing over the same, same set of objects on the hyperbolic surface but the function now is different. On the right-hand side, instead of getting the length of the boundary, you get the volume of the unit tangent bundle. So in particular, this thing here doesn't depend on the length of the boundary at all. Okay? It's just, you, you, take the area of the, you take the area of the surface, if you like, and then for, you know, you, for each point, you take the whole uh, set of two pi directions, so you just multiply by two pi, and that gives you the, the, so the volume of the unit, unit tangent bundle. Okay, the third identity, which is, of course, my favorite, is the machine identity. And I'll just do it, uh, I'll write first in the most simple case, which is a case for hyperbolic surface with one cusp. Okay. Now, if I have a cusp over here, I can find pairs of auto geodesic, uh, sorry, pairs of close, simple closed geodesics alpha and beta, such that... Uh, Together with the cusp, this forms an embedded pair of pens. Okay? 
And uh, the Maxian identity now says that the sum over all such pairs alpha and beta, okay, so let me draw it this way, of 1 over 1 plus e to the L of alpha plus L of beta over 2 is equal to half. So I he wrote it as half. Let me write the 2 on the other side. So this is the Maxian identity, and I want to stress to you again that this is an infinite sum. We're summing over all pairs of uh, simple closed geodesics alpha and beta, which sort of uh, cuts out an uh, embedded pair of pens together with this uh, cusp. Yeah. Now, in all of these identities that you see over here, you see that you require some kind of boundary, you know, and this you will see in the proof. Uh, you, you, you either need a cusp or you need a boundary component or you need a kind of a cone point to get started. So for a while, I guess uh, one of the questions I was interested in was whether you could get an identity for a closed surface. I gave a talk about this uh, some five years ago without actually proving anything. And someone in the audience, uh, Feng Luo, got very excited and said that he could uh, you know, find it interesting and started working with me. And so anyway, we sort of managed to prove the result. So this is a four, and this will be. So maybe I guess I, I'm saying this because uh, I guess the point is that you should just, if you find a talk interesting, talk to talk to the speak, talk to the speaker, and maybe something comes out of it. So let me have a surface, closed surface. So the identity looks like this. Okay, sum of f of p, the sum of g of t, is equal to the volume of the unit tangent bundle. Okay, this is my surface S. And what do I mean by P and T? Okay, so P are all the embedded pairs of pens. Okay, and T is the, all the embedded tori. So I'll just draw two examples of embedded pairs of pens and tori. So you could have a, for example, over here you could have a, this could be a P here. Right? You, you have an embedded pair of pens over here. You could have an embedded tori, which this could be a T. This is an example of embedded tori. There are infinitely many of them. Yeah. That's a good question. So, <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip some of the uh, generalizations, uh, but F and G are this. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so first of all, it looks kind of terrible. It's, if you work with it enough, you realize you, you start to love it, and then you sort of think, this is not so terrible. They've got some uh, you know, lovable points about them. So uh, let me just say something about why it looks a bit more complicated. Because if you have a pair of pens, there are several geometric invariants involved in a pair of pens. I mean, you know, there are three boundary components and things like that. So you have to take all this into account. Uh, and then, actually, if you look at the formula over there, uh, something turns up, which is the Rogers dialog rhythm, which is very similar to what happens in the Bridgman identity. And um, I forgot to write down. Sorry, maybe let me write this down. This is not. It's falling apart, <laughs> but. I think this should be correct. So this was a Bridgman function, okay? And correct, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm thinking uh, correct. I'm, I'm thinking properly embedded in the sense that all the three boundary components are distinct. Whereas if you have a, a tori, you could think of it as lots of possible different pairs of pens in there, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Not quite the same thing. Yeah. You have to sort of work slightly, a little bit differently for the. Because the G of T is kind of a, a sum, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you, you see that there's a sum involved in a, uh, uh, infinite sum involved in the G of T. Whereas the F of T is just a finite sum, sorry. Because uh, you, you can decompose the torus into a pair of pens in infinitely many ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so let me just explain something about this again. 
The Rogers dialog dialog turns, turns up, which is interesting because that's one of these functions that turns up in all kinds of weird and uh, weird places in number theory, in calculating the volume of uh, hyper three manifolds and so on. The second thing that's sort of, if you look at the terms over there, it looks kind of complicated, but they really are involve the cross ratio of certain points. Okay, so they're really cross ratios. They're not as bad as it looks. Okay, there, there's some cross, you know, you have a one, a three whole sphere or a pair of pants, and then if you look at uh, this picture inside the universal cover, inside uh, H2, there are certain cross ratio of certain endpoints, and this, these are what is appearing inside the Rogers dialog with them. Okay. okay, so these are the four sets of identities that I'm going to try and talk about, one, two, three, and four, and how are they sort of related in, in terms of the proof? Uh, the, the basic idea of the proof is very simple. So I'll tell you what the idea is. Um, since this is really the last, okay, I have to show you this page because this thing is recorded. Uh, people who've worked on this may go and read it, so I should uh, give credit to these people, yeah. So uh, Basmajan's identity, by the way, works for higher dimensions as well. Machen's identity was uh, generalized by Mizukani to uh, surfaces with boundary, geodesic boundary, uh, by myself and Wong and Chang to uh, cone surfaces, and then, uh, and in various other contexts, punctured surface bundles by Bowditch, Akiyoshi, Miyachi, and Sakuma. For quasi Fuchsian representations, also by Bowditch. Uh, for hypolytry manifolds from day surgery by myself, Wong, and Chang. For closed genus 2 surface by McShin himself. For Hitchin components, uh, rep so I think there were some talks on Hitch uh, Hitchin representations. Uh, so this was done by uh, Laburi and McShin. And uh, complex hypolytry representations by Kim Kim and Tan, but these two Kims, one of them is the same as the two Kims in one of the previous talks. The other one is not, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Do, uh, Norman Do and Norbury for two bridge uh, uh, as well, and then uh, Sakuma and Lee, uh, Lee and Sakuma. So anyway, there's a fair amount of work, I, I mean, to say, done on the Maxine identity. But since this is a talk for, you know, uh, with a lot of uh, young uh, people uh, participating, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in particular, uh, Pepe. <laughs> I want to say, so when, when McShane proved this identity, it was uh, quite beautiful and kind of uh, remarkable, and, but it's kind of an oddity. Yeah. Uh, it's like, what's it for? And, and so Ms. Kani, when she proved a generalization, used it uh, as a very important tool in uh, calculating the very Peterson volumes of the moduli space. And, uh, and also in calculating the asymptotics of the growth of a length of simple closed geodesics on the, on the surface. So this was maybe, I would say this part was one half of a uh, uh, Fields Medals winning work, maybe. And then she did some other things as well. Yeah. So anyhow, you know, you, you can do something and it's sort of interesting and you never know how useful it, it can become later. Yeah. Okay, uh, so for Bridgman, uh, he also uh, generalized it to higher dimensions with uh, Jeremy Khan. And then uh, I just want to say for our identity for closed surfaces, you actually can also do it for surfaces with boundary. You can also do it for non-orientable surfaces. Okay, and there are some possible applications. Actually, uh, what time do you want me to end? Quarter pass. Okay. Twenty pass. I'll try and end at quarter pass anyhow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I'll, I'll try and I'll try and end at uh, quarter pass. Okay. There are these four sets of identities, and um, there are some generalizations. Now it's all interesting and useful. How do you prove? How do you go about trying to prove your own identity? Yeah? So the basic. This is the basic idea. And I'm going to write it out because it's the basic. I'm going to clean this up. Okay. You choose some set X with a certain measure. Okay. I mean, if you like, think of it as a circle or just an interval or something like that. And then the measure of X should be uh, finite here. So you, whatever. It's the length of the circle. Okay. Then you try and decompose this set X in an interesting way, you see. 
So you, you just write x as, so as a kind of a countable union of disjoint subsets. Okay. Just, you know, you just divide it into pieces. There's countable many pieces. And then, but usually what happens is that this part over here doesn't cover all of x. And you have another piece over here. And this piece over here, which I just call Z, uh, typically is a very complicated piece. Okay. I mean, if you're in dynamical systems and all that, Z is the part where all the dynamics is happening. But as far as the identity is concerned, Z plays no role because the Z will have measure zero. Okay. So when, when you try and uh, compute uh, the measure of X, then you just take the sum of uh, measure of Z plus the sum of the measures of the WIs. But then this part will have measure zero, you see, even though it's a very complicated set. And then this part over here, uh, for part two, okay, for the B, which is actually a big part of this kind of problems, is you need to compute the measures of the set WI. Okay. I'm going to, I, I apologize to the experts in the field, or rather, <laughs> but I'm going to start with example minus one, okay. So example minus one is my set X is just the interval from zero to one with the measure one, right? And then what's my set Z, okay? My set Z is just uh, the set zero, half, three quarters, seven over eight. I just realized you could have taken for all you like zero, half, one third, uh, you know, one quarter and so on, okay? So what, can, what do you know about this set Z? This set Z is a countable set, so it has measure zero, right? On the other hand, it divides this uh, interval into countably many other open intervals. So you just need to sum up all the, uh, the measure of all the open intervals plus zero gives you one. In this case, I, I choose z in such a way that it's half plus one quarter plus one eight and so on is equal to one. Uh, if you choose the points half, one third, one quarter, one fifth and so on, you get a slightly more interesting identity. I just realized it's really, I mean, you, you don't really have to prove anything, right? You know, you don't have to try and use some geometric series or anything to prove this. I mean, this is the identity. You, you just need the fact that the, the set of uh, uh, rashness is a, is a countable set and so has measure zero. So we're going to example zero, okay? In example zero, we do a Cantor set construction, right? So my blackboard technique is terrible. <laughs> and I remove the middle third, and then I remove the middle third. Well, we all know this, yeah? And so on. And what's left over is a Cantor set. So the set Z is the Cantor set, okay? But the rest, consists of these open intervals. You see, there's a big one, which is, has uh, length one-third. There are two smaller ones, which has length uh, one over nine. And there are four smaller ones, which has length one over 27, and so on, right? Okay. So what we have really is the measure of x, which is equal to one, is the measure of the Cantor set, plus the sum of the measures of all the intervals, right? Okay, and then you get, a, you get a, a, again, a geometric series like this. But this example is a little bit more complicated because the set Z already is complicated. It's a Cantor set. I mean, it's not obvious that this thing has measure zero. I mean, in some sense, you need to prove that this thing has measure zero, right, to get the identity. Yeah. And, uh, but this is some, an exercise we often give to our students, proof that uh, this Cantor set has measure zero and then uh, has the big measure zero and you do it, yeah. Okay. So you get uh, something like this. And, Although this is a very simple example, essentially the bus margin and the machine identities are just this, okay? It's just that the difference is that the way that you do the decomposition of the set is a little bit more geometrically motivated. And because of geometry, the functions come up from geometry. Okay, so we do example one now, which is the bus margin. So what is the set X that I want for bus margin? The set X I want is basically the set of all 
unit tangent vectors uh, emanate uh, based at the boundary, okay, which are perpendicular to the boundary. Right? So x is a set of all unit tangent vectors perpendicular to the boundary, based at the boundary. What's the measure of this set? Well, the measure of this set is just the length of the boundary because basically at every, every point it gives you one tangent vector, right? Then what do you do? Well, if I give you a tangent vector v, I can just exponentiate the tangent vector, right? So expo you just expo exponentiate the tangent vector. You, just, you, know, you use it to, to create a geodesic. And you just do it. So you think of it as shining some laser beam, which on your surface, and it, and it goes along. What can happen when, when you do that? Well, two things can happen. Either in a finite time, it hits the boundary again, right? Or the other thing that can happen is that it goes on and on and on without ever hitting the boundary. Okay? What do you think is the likelihood that you will never hit the boundary again? Come on, I'm dying over here. <laughs> Elisha, you can give me a response. Zero, excellent. <laughs> so why is it zero? So essentially, you have to be extremely unlucky not to hit the boundary again. You know, there's only a, and, and you can see this quite clearly if you go to the uh, universal cover. Okay. What happened to my erasers? Okay. I'm slowly erasing the things I need, but never mind. When you go to a universal cover, so let, let me say this is a boundary component, and this is a fundamental sort of interval for the boundary component. Then you have all these uh, lifts of all these uh, boundaries over here, right? Okay. And basically what happens is that in order not to, not to, sorry, in order to continue on indefinitely, you really have to point towards a limit point. And the set of limit points looks like a Cantor set, and it has measured zero. Okay, by, so the, if you have a group, uh, I mean, what, what type do you call this? Type one, type two? I don't know. Okay, the, the set of limit points is a very small set. It has measured zero. Okay. So that will be your Z, you see. So the set of directions where you continue on indefinitely will have measure zero, and that's this set Z. But what happens if you hit the boundary? If you hit the boundary, you may hit the boundary tangentially, or I mean not quite uh, in an orthogonal way, but you can shift it a little bit, and you see that it's, this thing will be homotopic to an orthogeodesic. Okay. So if I started over here, I went around, and somehow I sort of hit this a little bit, off, yeah. I can shift this a little bit, and if you shift it a little bit, you know, you, you get a, 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 the same curve uh, up to homotopy, but eventually you can get the shortest representative. Yeah. So every, every V for which gamma V is finite is homotopic to some unique alpha I. You just sort of shorten you 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 sort of shorten the the curve you know, based you know, while moving the, the, the two endpoints uh, on the boundary. Okay, so every one is homoto homotopic to some unique uh, orthogeodesic alpha i, and we can now define W alpha i will be the set of all v, okay, inside which x such that gamma of v is homotopic to alpha i. So what I just say is that this set X now decomposes into this set of measure zero, this joint union with the W of alpha I. And you can then calculate the measure of W of alpha I. If you look at the universal cover picture again, you will see that basically you, you're going to be trying to measure something like this. Okay, you're, you're going to try and measure this interval over here. And the measure of this interval over here only depends on, this is a bad drawing, but it only depends on this length over here, which is the length of the alpha i. Okay. This is a, a very, very basic hyperbolic geometry computation. 
which maybe you did uh, last week. You do the calculation and then you just get the vast margin identity. Okay. So that's the vast margin identity. Yeah. Right. So it's sort of like you, you're, you're standing over here. I'm going to do what you do. It's like flailing all over. You're standing over here and you're looking down, and you sort of see the boundary, right? So like you may see one of these bound. Oh, sorry, I start from here. I see this boundary component. Now that boundary component yeah, projects onto yeah projects onto some piece over here. Mm. Onto yeah onto onto this onto, onto the yeah project on the geodesic on the left side yeah correct yeah so that's why I want to use oriented geodesics in order to sort of keep everything clean and yeah. Yeah, so it's just basically the projections of this geodesics onto the other geodesic, and then you calculate this thing, and then you sum it all up, and you get a bus margin identity. You can sort of see how to do this in higher dimensions and so on. I mean, this is a basic idea. Okay. I hope you all got this, because this is really the easiest case, but this was a paper in the American Journal of Mathematics in, I think, 1993, so I just, like I said, want to encourage the young people <laughs> that... Uh, you can get a very nice result without necessarily, you know, having a lot of technical expertise. Yeah. So you can do this, and how do you get the 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 machine identity then? Well, what you do is that instead of projecting a laser light, okay, you're, you're going to do exactly the same thing. You're going to do exactly the same thing. In, you start from. Let me, for simplicity, do it. From this picture, let's assume there's only one cusp. Okay, so I'll take, a, say, a, I take something over here, which is um, a horror cycle, and I look at a set of all uh, unit tangent vectors perpendicular to, to this coming out. Yeah. So what can happen? Okay. So basically, this, 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 uh, these things are coming from the, the cusp. Do not think of yourself as I mean, you, what could happen is what happened in a bus march. I think you, you, could, you go on and on and on. But now what you do is you think of yourself as building a wall, you see, instead of shooting a, a light beam. If you're building a wall, then if you hit yourself again, you cannot continue. I like to give this talk in China where, you know, there are great walls. <laughs> so you just go along, and then maybe you come back like this, and then the moment you hit yourself, you stop. Okay. So again, I'm going to ask this question. Out of all the possible uh, unit tangent vectors and all the things that you generate, what is the probability that you end up with something that has infinite length? Okay. So in order to get infinite length, you sort of have to keep avoiding yourself, you see. And if you know hyperbolic geometry, you know, if you have this surface, you can't, you, it's very hard to avoid yourself. It's, you sort of end up with smaller and smaller intervals. Uh, so this is really sort of the, so the answer to the question is that the probability that you go on and on and create a simple, a, a simple curve of infinite length, right? The probability of that happening is zero. And this comes from the Berman series result. Okay, so I should write it down. So there's going to be a set Z, which is a set of all V such that, say, uh, let me call this G of V, okay? It's infinite. And this set here has a measure zero by the Berman series. Okay, so we throw it away, see? I mean, we don't worry about how complicated the set looks, uh, you know, it's a horrible Cantor set looking thing. You just throw it away because there's measure zero. It's not going to be relevant to the identity. What's left over? What's left over will be geodesics G or V, which hit themselves, right? So when, you, when a geodesic hits itself, it's going to create some kind of topology over here. You know? It hits itself. You can look at the regular neighborhood of this geodesic. Okay? When you look at the regular neighborhood of this geodesic, you're going to have two other curves, to, which together with this uh, thing over here forms a pair of pants. I've drawn it, in this case, the two curves will be one curve over here, the other one will be homotopic to beta, right? So you have two, so just look at a small regular neighborhood and then you get this thing. 
But then you can always, because this is a hyperbolic uh, surface, you can always pinch your, 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 your curves tight. So you can, you can take geodesic representatives. So when you do that, which is this picture over here, you see that this thing here is sort of this curve G of V, this G of V, is embedded inside a pair of pens. So you can now, instead of doing this sort of global analysis over the surface, you can now restrict yourself to a local analysis on pairs of pens. Okay. So we just look at pairs of pens. So if I draw a pair of pens, what happens? This is mine, so I'm not going to clean it off. Uh, you have a pair of pens over here, and then Okay, and there's one sort of direction where it starts from the cusp and, and ends in the cusp, right? Okay, then somewhere around here you can go this way, and then you there's a kind of a limiting case where you spiral around this this. So let me call this alpha and call this beta, right? There's one thing over here which spirals around beta. What happens when you're in between here and here? If you're in between here and here, you'll be going around here a little bit, and then you sort of come back and hit yourself, you see. So similarly, there's, there's something over here which sort of goes spirals around here. There's a gap over here, you see. There's a gap over here where any unit tangent vector which lies inside this gap will produce a G of V, which is a spine for this uh, pair of pens. It's going to, so it will be associated to this pair of pens. If there's the same gap on the back side of this thing, there are two gaps. There's one in front, there's one at the back. But what happens if you go beyond here a little bit? If you went beyond here a little bit, it's going to cut the boundary component beta, beta right? Before it intersects itself. You're, you're going to go around this cylinder and then you're going to go across the boundary component before you intersect yourself. When this happens, by the time it intersects itself, it will be the spine for a different pair of pens. So it will correspond to a different alpha and beta, okay? different pair of and beta. So there's this thing over here, and I'm going to call it W alpha beta, for example, to be the set of all V uh, such that the, this, this truncated geodesic arc yeah, is a spine for uh, P alpha beta. Okay, so, so let me call this P alpha. This is the pair of pens determined by the, 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 the alpha and beta. Okay. Then again, what we have then here is that this thing over here, which is X, is the union of this with, with this set over here. So th there's, there's one horrible set very complicated, but which has measured zero, and then there's a countable, countable set, which, uh, which for which you can co compute the measure. Is it? So how do you compute the measure of this? Uh, I've more or less told you how to compute this thing. What you do is you just, you just, you need to be able to compute these gaps. Okay, so let me remind you how how you get the gap. You get a gap by there's there's a limiting geodesic over here which spirals into beta. There's a limiting geodesic over here which spirals into alpha. Spiral means it's sort of asymptotic towards alpha. And in between, everything is going to create a, a, a spine. So everything inside this, 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 uh, this interval over here corresponds to, uh, lives inside W alpha beta. Okay. Okay. So in a, in a machine identity, you can do this. And then if you do this, uh, and if you start out with a cusp, you get a machine identity, and then if you, st and you can also start out with a geodesic boundary component. There's no reason why you, sh you, sh you should start with a cusp. Sorry, you think that you are summing some measure over pairs of pens? Yeah, over pairs of pens. Over pairs of pens, uh, which contain a cusp. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at all pairs of pens which contain a cusp as a boundary component. And then there's a certain there's going to be a measure associated with each one of these pair of pens, which really depends on the local geometry over here. In other words, that only depends on the length of alpha and beta. It doesn't depend on the, the rest of the surface. Sorry? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. That's Mr. Khanis, uh, that's Mr. Khanis version of the matching identity. And I, okay, uh, I didn't write down the formula, but let me write it out for you. If I have something over here of certain length, delta, and here, uh, okay, so maybe I have an alpha and beta over here. The function becomes g of uh, delta over 2, alpha over 2, uh, beta over 2, where g of x, y, z is equal to log of uh, e to the x plus e to the y plus z over e to the minus x plus e to the y plus z. Okay. So there's, there's a completely explicit function that you can write for, for this. Is it, sorry? Yeah, this is a minus x. Oh, no, I, I'm taking over the halves over here. <laughs> because I didn't want to write all the halves in, inside here. Okay. <laughs> and, although there might be a two in front, of course, just because there's a front side and a back side. Okay. But basically, this is, this, this is the function. Okay. But th this is the basic idea. So, okay. Bridgman's identity. How does... Bridgman proved his identity. So you need a new idea. So I guess he was not aware of Bas Majan's identity. So uh, what he did, I mean, he came from a slightly different point of view, but what he did was the following. He looked at the unit tangent bundle first. You, notice you look at the set of all possible points with all possible directions, right? Which is really looking at a unit tangent bundle of the surface. So you don't start from the boundary over here. You start from inside. And where do you start? You start from everywhere. You see, that's the point. You don't just choose a specific starting point. You, start, you look at the, all possible starting points. So if I give you a V over here, a unit vector, uh, tangent vector over here, then what you can do is you can exponentiate in a forward direction and a backward direction, right? And you'll get some geodesic, uh, which... Okay, so you can exponentiate in a forward and backward direction, and you get some geodesic gamma of V. Again, what's the, the question here is, what is the probability that you do not hit the boundary? Okay. I mean, if you start from any points at the surface, you know, and the direction, you sort of choose this, this uh, uh, exponential, this geodesic, what is the probability that you, 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 know, you, you somehow go on forever, either in the forward direction or the backward direction? So I, I'll just tell you, the answer is again zero. Okay. The set of such directions is very, very small. And this follows from uh, a goddessy of the geodesic flow. Okay. So you see that a lot of things, I mean, <laughs> sort of go into saying, you know, you don't have to prove it anymore because some, someone's proven it. But the fact that Z has measured zero actually is not really obvious. <laughs> but it's been done, you see. Okay. So, so the Z, there, there, there's some set which has measured zero. And uh, we ignore that set. But then what's left over will be things for which gamma of v is finite. In other words, it's going to hit the, uh, the boundary in the forward direction, and it's going to hit the boundary in the backward direction. Right? But if that happens, you're almost back to the same thing as the bas margin identity. You see? Because that, that thing is going to be homotopic to uh, auto-geodesic. Okay? It's going to be homotopic to auto-geodesic. You can sort of shift the two endpoints a little bit. and, and so, so every finite geodesic arc, uh, starting and ending at a boundary, is homotopic to a unique auto-geodesic. And how do you do a calculation over there? Well, you can do the calculation as follows. Um, you, you choose a lift, okay? You choose a lift, and then here's uh, sort of the auto-geodesics of alpha i, okay? You choose a lift to the, universal, to the universal cover, and you're really looking for all unit tangent vectors. So let me put this in a, put a direction into here. You're looking for all unit tangent vectors which sort of end on this part and, sorry, start from this part and end over this part. Okay. So you have to look for things that look like this. Okay. So you're looking for all tangent vectors for which 
uh, if you exponentiate in a forward and backward direction, the starting point is over here, somewhere on this uh, geodesic and ending point is somewhere on this geodesic. And you have to do a calculation. And, and Richmond spent about several pages doing this calculation, six or seven pages. I mean, he's quite good at these things. <laughs> he eventually ended up with this, uh, the Bridgman function, which is of VR of, so of x is equal to 4 times the Rogers dialogism of uh, secant square, I think x over 2. Okay. So Caligari, who's even better at this <laughs> calculation, sort of did the calculations in half a page, I guess, uh, using a slightly different point of view. Anyway, but there's a, there's a certain amount of work involved after you get the idea. <laughs> So what do you do for closed surfaces? So in my last, well, seven minutes, I'll try and indicate how you can get an identity for closed surfaces. So if you sort of look back at what happens in a bus margin identity, you had to have a boundary to start with, to, to, to get started, right? Because, you know, you were sort of decomposing the boundary of the surface. If you look at Bridgman's identity, you, you also needed boundaries because otherwise, if, for example, this was a cast or this was, was a closed surface, the thing goes on forever. I mean, there's, there's, there's no way to do anything. And if you look at uh, the machine identity, again, you started from some kind of boundary component. So the question then is, uh, if, you start, if you had a closed surface with no boundary, where do you start? So when I first found out about Bridgman's paper, I guess I was quite excited and I was looking at it. And and then one night, I guess it just hit me that the, he, the idea was exactly what he did, which is you start from anywhere and everywhere. <laughs> you look at the unit tangent bundle. Yeah. But then if you understood the proof of the machine identity, you realize, okay, what you do is you start from anywhere and everywhere, but you try and create some topology. You know, instead of exponentiating the thing until it goes on forever and covers up the whole surface or whatever, you try and stop before you, you know, when, when, whenever you hit yourself, you, you sort of build a wall so that you can create some kind of topology. Okay? And that's the basic idea. So you start from anywhere. You take a unit tangent vector V. Okay? And you're going you're gonna to exponentiate this uh, thing in both the forward and backward direction. And for simplicity, we do it in equal speed. Okay? So you have two teams of people building a wall, one in the forward direction and one in the backward direction. Then what happens? Well. There's a kind of a, I don't have colored chalk, but well, there are two teams of people. So one, one red wall and one white wall, whatever. Yeah. Both. But anyway, you just continue until you hit, you hit the wall, either built by yourself or the, op, or the opposing team. Right? Then the, the other team will continue on until it hits the wall as well. So what do you create? When you do this, typically you create some kind of graph embedded in the surface, which, has, uh, which is of Euler characteristic minus one. You know, it's basically, you create a kind of a figure, fig, you know, something homotopic to two, to, to, uh, two loops. Okay. But, of course, there's a possibility that you went on and on and you built this really long wall and you never really hit yourself. <laughs> and you just managed to go on and on. You, you chose this point in this direction where it just went on and on. Okay. But again, it's not likely to happen. <laughs> okay. In fact, it's completely, the, the probability that you started with a point in a direction where you have, a, you know, you have this infinite length wall is zero. And this follows uh, from either a godicity or of the geodesic flow, or it follows from the Berman series argument. Basically, there's just very few possibly, there's almost no chance of not hitting yourself. Not almost. There's, from a measured theoretic point of view, there's no chance of not hitting yourself. Okay, so you do, and so that set again, like I say, is a really complicated looking sub subset of the unit tangent bundle. We throw it all away because the set has measured zero. What's left over will be sets of unit tangent vectors V such that let me call this thing over here G of V, okay? So there's, there's V, and then uh, this, this object over here is some G of V, which is this graph, such that, uh, well, G of V is a finite graph. But when you have something like this, then you can do the same trick as you did for the machine identity, you see? Because you can look at the regular neighborhood of this thing over here. If you look at the regu regular neighborhood of this, 
It's either a three-hole sphere or a one-hole tor torus. Okay. You can do that, and then, so you, for example, you might get some a three-hole sphere, and then you can again do the trick of pulling this boundary of the regular neighborhood tight. Okay, you can, you can sort of, and then you have to prove that somehow when you pull this tight, this graph over here still lies inside the embedded pair of tens or, or punctured torus. That's not very difficult, but is it obvious to you, Mahan? Which? This one, yeah. Yeah, it's, you have string away from uh, away from this thing here. Yeah, yeah, it strings away from this thing. It's not that difficult anyway. But so you you sh so what's the point over here? You 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 then reduce yourself to a local analysis. You see, I mean, you have a surface of genus i, genus g. Everything's really complicated. But really, when you try and do this thing over here, you only need to look at this embedded pairs of pens or embedded uh, punctured uh, one hole torus. So if I just look at one of these uh, pairs of pens which lies embedded inside here with geodesic boundary. So I take a pair of pens over here like this. The question becomes, how, for which tangent vectors, unit tangent vectors V, right, will I uh, generate a spine? Okay, so maybe it might go like this, a spine for this pair of pens. So the way I drew this over here, this particular V may be generated, generated a, a spine, but Sometimes you hit the boundary of the pair of pens before you were able to uh, hit yourself, right? When that happens, you've gone beyond that boundary, and then you, you, what you've done is that corresponds to a different pair of pens, embedded pair of pens. So this gives you a decomposition of the unit tangent, uh, the unit tangent bundle of this uh, surface into one horrible piece Z, which has measure zero, and a countable union of pieces which are sort of indexed by the embedded pairs of pens and the embedded uh, one-hole tori. Okay. Computing this thing here is, is a pain. This was a thing I couldn't do. So when I got this idea, I thought, what the hell, I'll just give this talk anyway. <laughs> and I think, oh, it's almost impossible to really get a formula for this, this thing. It looks terribly complicated. Anyway, but uh, Feng Luo was really good. At it. He just sort of zoomed in, and, and, and together we managed to get a formula. So that's where this, this, this identity comes from. This is the F, this is the G, and, and, and then you have to calculate. I mean, really, you need to do some work and calculate these uh, functions F and G. And then if you do that, you can, you can get the volume. So, uh, so my point, in some sense, is that you need a good idea, and you need a little bit of technical expertise, and you want to put it all together. And you need a, you need a lot of luck so that this thing maybe is useful to someone else. Okay, so I'll stop here. <laughs>